So I'm going to talk to you today about when content goes wrong and why. It will just be a brief overview. There's much more to this. Um, but as I said, this is a lightning talk just to show you some funny examples, but also the serious side of um, content when it's not good enough for users. It's not like me to start on a negative, um, but I do want to say that content design is not copy editing. And the reason I want to say this is because you can have sublime grammar, a perfectly correct spelling, and it can still be wrong. Um, so for example, this was on a website for a large oil and gas event. <laughs> <laughs> so although it's grammatically correct, it's, yeah, it will make people laugh. It's not hurting anybody, but it may not be good for that uh, particular brand. This was on a letter um, about a healthcare tribunal. And I think they meant they wanted an impartial person there, not a completely disinterested person. Um, this, um, when I joined Universal Credit um, in the UK, if you are caring for somebody, you can apply for a carer's allowance, but you have to tell the government if you stop providing that person with care. And I thought this was great. I almost didn't want to change this. <laughs> Um, and it's not just digital, of course, this came through the door last week. I cannot figure out why a whole page of this leaflet has a keyboard on it. I think it's just trying to tell me I can order kind cereal bars online. And then, of course, we've got the bad old error messages. Thankfully, there are far fewer grey pop-ups with nonsense content on than there used to be. But terrible error messaging still abounds and it's you know, really painful for users from the top example where you get the error message before you've even started filling out the data, we've all had those. The middle example where I just don't have any clue, you're not giving me any decent information about what's happened or what I can do about it. And my personal favorite where the user can actually be in denial there ever was an error message. Everything's fine, I'll just be in a constant loop. Um, so that's the funnies, um, but unfortunately, you know, bad content is pretty serious. Um, there are studies that show Bad content, impenetrable content, complex language um, causes stress to all of us. And that's not just people um, who have dyslexia or it's not their native language or they have dyspraxia. Um, heart rate can increase when you are faced with something you don't easily understand. And of course, bad content stops users from doing something, be that um, buying something, registering for a coffee subscription, a PrEP, uh, although PrEP's content is absolutely amazing. I happen to know the content designer there, another EE content designer. Um, the other thing is that bad content with forms particularly, if a form it has the incorrect flow, incorrect labels, mislabeled buttons, you can really make the, unwittingly the user will give you incorrect data. And, and that's hard for, for any service. Um, and any set of you know, staff or back-end case workers. And the last thing really is um, bad content really isn't good for your brand. Why content goes wrong? Really, there's quite a few things here, um, but the, the, the main reasons I've seen over the years of doing this is that um, with no one intent, delivery teams try, really, they throw everything at the user that they think the user might need. From a, from a brochure to a text to an online service or product, every single word needs a reason to be there, a reason for the user as well. Um, so content designers, we don't just write, we actually, I think we spend about 60% of our time stopping words reaching a product or a service. Um, and the best way we can do that, of course, is working with user researchers, um, testing with less, so to test with less content so that you actually get the validation that additional messaging is needed. That's quite a brave approach um, that takes time and, and expertise in your research team. Yeah, I think the other thing is that um, without, without looking through a user-centered lens, experts will always use, you know, will naturally use jargon and complex language because it's their own language. They don't realize that it is complex to somebody else. And I think that the role of a content designer really, again, is less about writing and more about translation. We spend more of our time listening, um, listening to the business needs or government needs, listening to the user needs, watching users interact with content. And it's only once we've listened to all that and seen that that we can work in the intersection and say, right, we will create some concise, clear content. That's everything the business needs to say, but is still inherently useful and correct for users. 
Um, also, of course, unlike code, everybody can write, absolutely everybody, and everybody gets very excited about getting involved with content, but designing by committee is a really long, painful process, and it always ends up in long, painful sentences and content. It's, it's just too much. And I think, again, here, the key is you need to listen to all your stakeholders, listen to your subject matter experts, but then have the bravery to stick to a tone, to a style, and to your user research, so that you're saying everything you need to say, but with fewer words. Oh, and this is a classic. Um, so you've done your discovery, you've designed your product or your service, and a couple of weeks before release, you're like, oh, somebody should probably look at the content. Um, and it's too late at that point to improve the flow of content, um, to juggle hierarchy around, to challenge where the content needs to be there. At that point, you're really just spell checking. There's not much else you can do. Um, and rush content at the end of a project, it's rarely designed well. So readability may be uh, lacking in terms of how you design that content, how you chunk it up, how you use your subheaders. Um, accessibility is often an afterthought. Have all your images got um, useful and clear uh, tags for screen readers? Um, is it inclusive? So for example, this is a rushed poster that came out for COVID and got lambasted uh, quite rightly for the imagery on it, because content isn't just words. You know, this imagery here was just reinforcing some very old stereotypes around the role of the man in the house and the role of the women. And quite rightly, this got pulled, but I think that imagery was somewhat rushed. The other thing here, which is really key, and I'm so pleased um, to be a part of within government, technical writing particularly is quite, um, it, it's realizing that some of the language we use like blacklist and whitelist, is not appropriate. Black is not bad, white is not good. So in technical writing, there's a in the UK government, and I believe a lot of the other technical organizations, we're moving from blacklist to block list, white list to allow list. We're also looking at um, labels like slave and master files. So I think that's a fantastic um, move forward. But also if you rush content, you may not be as cognizant of those, th those nuances. And of course, uh, once you're live, I think it's really, really key with digital content, we can and we should improve the content that we've got there. But all too often this is done with no evidence or without interrogating the evidence that we have. Um, I'm sure it's so tempting if a product owner comes to you and says, hey, I saw this tweet from one user at the weekend and they need this message just to cheaply, because people say, well, it's a bit of content, it's always cheaper than doing the code or doing other things. And the temptation is just to actually, you know, almost carpet bomb your content with, um, you know, with this kind of feedback, responding immediately to this kind of feedback. But we have to check the analysis. We have to look at the numbers, check the Google Analytics, look how many people this is affecting, see if there's anything else we can do other than content. And then in that situation, possibly ask your user research team to dig deeper or pop that issue on a watch list. So um, how do you make sure your content is good? If your service has words or any other content, pictures, um, video, if it's just emojis in the future, <laughs> get a content designer and ideally an equal experts one. <laughs> and really key I think here is make content part of your design team from the start. Ideally, if budget allows, bring a content designer on during discovery. This is when we get to listen to all those needs, business needs, user needs, government needs, uh, and be part of the vision of where the service or product is going. Definitely get your content designer involved in the design phase because we work very closely with interaction designers, um, looking at the flow of content, the hierarchy, the readability, um, so it's, it's really kind of design pairing um, with, with a service designer or an interaction designer. Um, because actually a lot of our work happens in this phase, content design happens before we even start writing the words um, and testing the words and iterating the words with users. And to close, this is a, a tweet from a, a friend and colleague. Content design is saying, you should have invited me to an earlier meeting until you die. Possibly not until you die, but certainly <laughs> until you retire. <laughs>